Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. My name is Tim Ogden, and I'm the Managing Director of the Financial Access Initiative, and welcome to uh, today's live conversation on microfinance impact from Bangladeshi villages to urban New Jersey. Uh, I'm joined today by Jonathan Mordock, who is the founder of FAI and our Executive Director, as well as a Professor of Economics and Public Policy at NYU Wagner. Hey, Tim. If you're not familiar with the Financial Access Initiative, we are a research center house at NYU for Agner focused on how financial services can better meet the needs and improve the lives of poor households around the world. Um, we uh, do a lot of work trying to systematize evidence, understand what's happening, um, communicate it to people who may not be in the depths of the details. Uh, we're most known uh, for our work with financial diaries, both internationally and here in the US. If uh, you find today's conversation of interest in the kinds of things that we talk about, please do subscribe to our, it says weekly newsletter, it's really not weekly, um, and it is not about us, to be clear. It is uh, a review of evidence and interesting ideas that are happening in the world of financial inclusion globally. Um, you can also follow all that we do on financialaccess.org. But today our topic is specifically about microcredit impact. Uh, particularly because a new study uh, was published uh, about 10 days ago, maybe two weeks ago, um, uh, an RCT of Grameen America's program. Um, and it's remarkable that we've come from a place where uh, it took many, many years to get impact evaluations of microcredit. And uh, to be honest, uh, Grameen uh, Bank was one of the organizations that often made the argument in public that RCTs uh, weren't revealing the truth, uh, weren't particularly necessary. Uh, and now we have a Grameen offshoot um, promoting, uh, you know, sponsoring and promoting uh, RCT evidence. And so that's some of what we want to talk about today is this, uh, where we are in microcredit and understanding impact, uh, how this particular study in the U.S. Um, uh, expands, amplifies, perhaps changes our understanding of what we've learned from uh, microcredit impact studies in other places. So Jonathan, let me just start off to let everybody know, this is gonna be just a conversation between you and I, but we are gonna take uh, questions and answers from the audience. You'll see that there's a Q and A uh, option on the bottom of your screen. So if anything that we talk about prompts some questions from you or there are issues that you want us to address, please do go ahead and put those into the Q and A and we'll work those into the conversation. Uh, but Jonathan, um, you uh, have been there since the beginning in these debates about what, what is the impact of microcredit? Do you talk a little bit about the, the evolution of evidence here and why it took so long to get to impact evaluations in microcredit? Yeah, hey Tim. You know, before we do that, I just wanna say a, a few things. This is really a nice opportunity. So thank you to CFI and everybody for making this possible. Tim and I talk all the time, or it seems like all the time, a lot of the time, every day. Um, and it's nice to, uh, you know, open that up to a broader audience. And often what we're talking about is exactly this kind of thing. You know, how should we understand the literature? Where are the open questions? Um, how to move forward? So this is really great. I just wanna also say about this Grameen America um, study, which is coming out, it has been released, but it's not published in the sense, and I have to say this as an academic, not published in the sense that it's gone through peer review and is um, being published in a journal. That process, I assume, if it goes forward, is, uh, is going to happen you know, months, years in the future. It's also an 18-month um, RCT, and there's going to be another round um, at the end of 36 months. So hopefully we'll be back to talk about that. But it is an important moment. It's an interesting moment. And as we'll get into the conversation, we'll see that it lines up in interesting ways with the international evidence. But the question, Tim, you just asked, is why we don't have more international evidence and why it took so long. And having been part of these conversations for so long, I, my sense is the big reason why we haven't had much evidence for a long time is that there really was an interest on the part of donors and the part of programs. You need both. You need money to fund studies and you need the programs to be open to being evaluated. It takes some courage, it takes some guts. I mean, hats off to Grameen America um, for opening themselves up that way. And I think the reason they didn't do it earlier, not Grameen America, but the sector as a whole, was that 
there was a sense that the market test was working. And there's something I always, when I say that, I always think of Esther Duflo had a, a line that was quoted in the New Yorker where she called it the idiotic market test. Um, but the market test idea was that, look, you've got a product and people are buying it. They're paying interest, they're repaying loans. The mere fact of their engagement with microfinance, the demand for microfinance, the expansion of microfinance. So all of those supply side issues ought to be enough to say, hey, something's going on here that's powerful. Now, Duflo, of course, didn't agree with that. I don't think we agree with that, but I think that is a basic story about why it's taken so long. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, uh, you know, idiotic in the sense of accepting it as the sole proof, but I think it is important to acknowledge that um, microcredit reached people who were not being reached by formal services and reach them with a product is, you know, one of my big takeaways from Portfolios of the Poor, which is not an impact evaluation, was how much people valued uh, the access to an institution that was rules-based, that was reliable, that, um, and we can, we can talk some about consumer protection issues, but the very least seemed to care uh, minimally about these poor customers. And there weren't very many institutions, formal institutions certainly, who are willing to do that. And so that the market test, if, if we just accept it at face value, absolutely, it's idiotic. But the market test is important when saying, are we designing a product that's useful to these customers? Uh, and are we delivering something that's new and different to them? Yeah, I, you know, the way I, I see that, I think that that's exactly right. I mean, it poses a challenge for the randomistas, the eval evaluators. Um, is it, if the evaluators come with a bottom line that says, hey, this isn't really doing anything in people's lives, let's say, you know, the main effects are zero. The market test question is still valid. It's like, well, then what's going on? Why do people keep on coming back? Why are they paying their hard earned um, money? Maybe the evaluators are looking at the wrong things. Um, I mean, to that, that specific point, um, Lant Pritchett has referred to RCTs as weapons against the weak uh, and pointed out sort of the political economy. Y you and I are in this new uh, uh, Oxford University press book that's come out, uh, again, taking a look at some of the RCT debate, and that's, we're not gonna stray off into RCTs, but uh, there is this interesting dynamic of, you know, in the early 80s into the mid 90s, microcredit was on the ascendancy and so there wasn't an incentive for providers to distract themselves with an RCT. There has been this change overall in how we think about financial inclusion and what it does uh, and how to measure it um, that I think is a driver of some of these impact evaluations is that the, the funders wanted it because they were no longer so convinced and the providers needed it because they needed to respond to the, the critiques. They weren't in a position of ascendancy anymore um, and so the, the RCT came along at a moment uh, where microcredit wasn't as you know, powerful as in vogue as it was. And now we're at this point where we've had a, a series of RCTs um, internationally and domestically that seem to largely come to the same conclusions and, and then lead us to, I, I think, to a question of you know, where do we go from here? And that's where we want to end up today. But let's frame some of this here for the folks that may not be fully aware of the Grameen America study. Would you just sort of walk us through the, you know, the, the big picture um, and the main findings? Yeah, so first, um, just want to lay out uh, full disclosure. I was on the advisory committee for this study, but it was a pretty limited role. So I really had nothing to do with data collection or um, analysis. This is a survey and a study that was done by the MDRC, the Manpower Development Research Corporation. I think I've got that right. The MDRC, one of the great um, evaluation organizations in the United States and um, started a few years ago. Now we're at the 18 month point. And as I said, we'll get to the 30 or they will get to the 36 month point. The program, Grameen America, it's interesting, like other countries um, in the US, they started a Grameen offshoot um, spent a little bit of time getting to know the one in Glasgow, Scotland, which is now shut down. Um, but the Grameen America one has been doing well. And in fact, expanding from its base in Queens and New York um, to the New Jersey side of the, um, of the river. And this 
RCT takes advantage of that opening up those new branches. So it's in Northern New Jersey in the US outside New York City. Um, and it really takes a basic Grameen lending structure. Right, where it's group lending, women are together in solidarity groups. Uh, they're all individually responsible for their loans, but if one of them fails to pay within the small group, um, they, their future access to loans is in jeopardy. This population is interesting. It's uh, almost all Hispanic or Latina, uh, average age 41, so not, you know, not very young and neither very old. Um, a lot have families and kids, as you'd imagine, uh, at that age. Fewer than 20 percent, sorry, fewer than 10 percent were born in the U.S. About three quarters say they don't speak English very well, and about two thirds have a high school education or less. So it's a relatively less educated, not speaking English well, recent immigrants, and they're really trying to um, improve conditions um, and support families. So it's a, it's a really important uh, group that's come to Grameen really looking to move forward. Technically, they are below the poverty line on average. Um, average household income is about $23,000 US, um, about 50% of baseline had jobs, about three quarters had a business at baseline. And that changed, uh, you know, with the intervention. Um, but then we get Jonathan to the bottom line, which is what everybody wants to know. So we've got this population of interest that is distinct. Um, I, I will just take a moment here, by the way, to point out, because I do a lot of work with uh, microfinance in the United States. And this is a term in microcredit that uh, gets often used, but different people mean very, very different things. And so the Grameen study, as you pointed out, these are very small loans, 500 to $1,500. Uh, typically where you hear people referring to microfinance in the United States, we're talking about organizations like the uh, Axion Network Affiliates, uh, Opportunity Fund, Lift Fund, DreamSpring, organizations like that that are making loans that are $25,000, $50,000 to already existing formalized businesses, often with a handful of employees. And so you, something that's really interesting here is that this is really a transplanting of the international model to the United States and not adjusting to you know, fully to a context of small business in the United States, that this is targeting the same kind of uh, people at, at marginal and in uh, populations really on the edge of the economy, often in the informal economy, than you would see in microfinance globally. Uh, but, you know, bottom line, what we see is um, business income goes up, but total earnings don't. And that does align a lot with what we saw internationally. Yeah, I mean, we should step back. I mean, this is a randomized trial, first of all. So about 800 people um, got access, um, randomly chosen, and, and there was a control group of about 350, maybe. Um, there is, you know, when you ask people, I mean, you, Tim, you and I have talked a bunch about this, but when you ask people, so you ask for self-reports, how are you doing? Um, are you able to cope with, um, you know, challenges that life is throwing you? You know, the evidence looks really good for Grameen America and the intervention. Like if you ask people how satisfied they are with life, about 70% in the um, in the Grameen America group said they're very satisfied versus 56%, um, which is a notable difference, 56% in the control. If you ask people if they can pay their rent and you know pay their utility bills, cell phone bills, get prescriptions, you know, not run out of money, everyone's still struggling, but they're struggling less in the Grameen America group. But these are self-reports. And so what's so striking is, is you're saying, Tim, when it comes to average net income in the prior month, right? The dollar figure. It's roughly the same. In fact, the control group's slightly ahead. So it's about 1300 for the control group, just under $1,300 um, for the um, treatment group. And we can see that partly that's because business income's gone up, but as Tim, you're saying, labor income's gone down. It's a bit of a wash. We just don't see an impact at 18 months. And this, this, this ties back to sort of this market test of, you know, how should we be thinking about these things? And I mean, it, you know, it aligns not with a microcredit RCT, Jonathan, but a study that you were involved in for a, a, a similar program in some sense, the targeting the ultra poor programs that have received a lot of attention for a lot of positive um, 
uh, positive impact, measurable increases, uh, but you were involved in uh, a targeting the ultra poor impact evaluation that has been very influential in my thinking because it found that uh, the labor market situations were really important, that people were moving in and out of labor markets depending on what the best thing for them was. And in places where there were thick labor markets and people had an option that they would drop out of certain programs to, to take wage jobs. Um, what it seems like we're seeing here is that people are dropping out of wage jobs to do something that they would presumably prefer to do. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there's a sense in the broader literature, I think, emerging that uh, a lot of people are reluctant entrepreneurs to use the language um, that Abhijit Banerjee and his collaborators use. So reluctant entrepreneurs are doing it because that's really the best opportunity they have. There really aren't jobs. And the idea is when there are good jobs, solid jobs, um, they'll look for them. But of course, it's hard to find a job that's also flexible enough to let you have childcare and um, meet other needs. So yeah, this is striking. Although we, you know, they found something like this similarly in Morocco, um, that mm -hmm. there's no net effect because business income went down, but went up, but um, farm labor particularly fell down. Yeah. yeah. So we are seeing this in other places, and it suggests there's something interesting that's going on here, that these averages are hiding some interesting action. So uh, you, you mentioned the reluctant entrepreneur. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting uh, that we need to continue to pay attention to the Grameen America is the kinds of businesses that people operate. And I, I get this isn't just Grameen America, it's a, 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 across microcredit, is that one of the reasons for skepticism all along in you know, what microcredit uh, could accomplish is that the kinds of businesses that these low income households who borrow from microcredit who are targeted by microcredit can actually start are, are just generally not that profitable. Um, they, uh, they either um, don't require much capital, which means you have a lot of other people coming into it, uh, or they do acquire capital and, and you've got to be paying off that capital. Uh, and so th there's always a puzzle of if, uh, you know, how much income can a uh, undifferentiated fruit seller uh, generate? How much profit can they generate? How much can a, a seamstress generate? Um, and what we see in some of the Grameen results it is this question about what kinds of business people are operating. About 30% of them appear to be operating uh, what are, are broadly termed as multi-level marketing businesses, something like Herbalife, Amway, Avon, um, where you're buying something from a wholesaler and then selling it on. Um, does that concern you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's hard to know. I, I, I hope that the 36 month evaluation of in America digs deeper on this. Um, it concerns me, and I mean, more broadly, I think, the idea that you're gonna find your way out of poverty by selling cosmetics to your friends um, and community. Um, the broad evidence, you know, put aside the RCTs, but the broad evidence on, on these small firms is not, um, not so positive. So yes, definitely concerned and, and more broadly internationally. I mean, I think that the frame that's been helpful to me, you know, and lines up with lots of other pieces of evidence, you know, this idea of reluctant entrepreneurs who may be, you know, equivalent to what you're saying, Tim, you know, together with what Banerjee et al. call, uh, you know, gung-ho entrepreneurs are just people who really do seize this opportunity and they grow. Mm -hmm. And they're always the one who are featured in the, you know, the advertisements, the stories. They are inspiring and they are real mm -hmm. cases. They're just a sliver of the real cases. And, you know, something we'll, we'll return to is the question of, is it even plausible to identify the gung-ho entrepreneurs uh, in a way that, in a business model that, that can, um, can operate at scale? to serve those entrepreneurs. But uh, I did wanna to touch on one other thing that I, I found remarkably consistent with some of the international literature, which isn't uh, necessarily about microcredit per se, but in this 18 month finding it, the uh, participants do report an increase in savings. But savings, understanding what's going on in savings is a, is a big, big question for me. I'll take the opportunity to uh, advertise that uh, you can see on the financial access that our website, we're doing a webinar about savings in conjunction with Aspen's financial security program on October 28th. 
uh, to, in part to address this because of this common issue of people report that they've got more savings, but they don't report more income. And so there's a question like, where are the savings coming from? Uh, but it's also measured at a single point in time and it's only self-reports. And the program itself heavily encourages savings. And so to me, there's a big question of, did the people learn that they're supposed to say that they saved more or do they actually save more? And if they did save more, where did it come from? And why aren't they investing it in the business if the business is profitable? Uh, so, you know, some real puzzles about what the action is happening underneath the covers of the choices that people are making. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, in that case, the, um, I, I think for Grumman America, savings is a requirement in part. And I, I'd love to see more, you know, dug into. What we found in the US Financial Diaries was, you know, in similar populations, in fact, we had some Grumman America customers, um, borrowers within the Financial Diaries sample, you know, they were sending a lot of money as remittances. My big question is whether some of what's going on is they're saving more in the bank here rather than sending it onward to relatives or to save uh, in other places. I'm not sure. Mm. But, you know, I just, the savings results important, right? You know, I highlighted that other result about the self-reported ability to, you know, pay your bills and utilities and not be so stretched. I think that's really the big key here, which is I think people are happy to be in Grameen America and, and do genuinely feel that life is improving because they have liquidity. That was a big lesson from Portfolios of the Poor and other studies. Just having liquidity in a situation where liquidity is scarce and expensive can be really powerful. But seeing that as you know, the, a key element of microfinance requires really rethinking microfinance and sort of moving it from the discourse that's all about um, entrepreneurial finance. Well, I mean, let's use that as a transition to the big picture of what all, all this means. Um, you know, we, we obviously can't take the time to go into detail on all of these studies, but you know, there is this consistency where we find that labor markets really matter, uh, that uh, microcredit is operating in this realm of, of not great jobs uh, that people uh, take because they don't have other options. And when they get another option, many of them seem to prefer the self-employment option. Um, there's some other evidence from other places that that doesn't necessarily stick when people are making choices between vocational training and self-employment and factory jobs. But what I see overall is this question of uh, what, we're, what we need to be thinking of is that we've got a population of frustrated employees, not frustrated entrepreneurs. And the, the rhetoric around microcredit that there's this huge group of people who want to be entrepreneurs or just waiting to be unleashed. Uh, what people really want are jobs and they want jobs that pay them enough to take care of their families. And they want those jobs to not suck, um, which is, you know, by and large, the jobs that are available to Latina immigrants in Union City, New Jersey, and in much of the country, um, but also uh, internationally. It, the, my, my favorite paper in this regard is, uh, is one that uh, Emily Breza and Cynthia Kinnan did following up in Andhra Pradesh after the crisis and looking at what happened when microcredit went away because of the entrepreneurship crisis. And what they find is that people sort of abandon their microenterprise and go back to wage labor. And wage labor rates fall because you have this influx of, of, of people seeking casual labor. Uh, and so that, you know, it gives us a different flavor on what microcredit is actually accomplishing, that it's pulling people out of the labor market and that's benefiting everybody. The people who pull out of the labor market would rather be operating a microenterprise than doing casual labor. The people who stay in casual labor markets earn more because uh, they're more in demand. If we conceive of microcredit that way, uh, that really it is a labor market intervention, uh, what do you think that means for microcredit institutions and for funders? I'm gonna pause for one second, Tim, because I'm watching the clock as are you. Yes. Like we have about five minutes. We do. So we are happy to answer questions. Tim, you want to give the spiel on the Q&A? Uh, please do. You can use the Q&A panel. We don't have any questions entered in yet. And I can't imagine that Jonathan and I are that interesting, but nobody has any questions or other things they'd like to raise. So please do uh, feel free to answer some, some 
or to ask some questions or some pose some points there that uh, you think need addressing. Yeah, and if we, in the next few minutes, we'll uh, hope to respond. Um, yeah, no, I think that the way to think about microfinance is definitely that way. Um, in terms of thinking about it alongside labor markets. I mean, you know, you described a lot of low-wage jobs as sucking, um, but I think we could be more precise. I mean, hours are inflexible often. It's hard to um, actually go onto the sites. Uh, there are a whole series of constraints that we could actually think about, um, you know, finding ways to improve labor market regulation, just as we've been pushing on consumer protection for microcredit and, you know, financial inclusion, I think those same kinds of things for jobs would really, um, would really be helpful. Um, here, I'm going to tee you up uh, very much, Jonathan, for another paper that you have on the subsidy in microcredit, because often sort of lost in these conversations is um, the, the cost benefit analysis and not just the return. And um, would you just quickly summarize your paper with uh, uh, Asla Demirovich Kunt and Bob Cull on subsidy and microfinance and microcredit and, and how that should play into this conversation? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that super quickly. Liz McGinnis has an interesting question, which I hope we can get to. So I'll just, I'll say, you know, one of the things that the randomista crowd and the evaluation crowd has been really good at is focusing on impact studies. Um, but really in the end for policymakers, you want to know costs and benefits. So impacts relative to costs. So we went out and did that. Um, you know, one of the arguments not to do an impact evaluation is if these are profitable firms providing microfinance, then, you know, maybe the impacts are less. We saw a lot of subsidy, a lot of subsidy. Most internationally, most firms <laughs> providing microfinance were not profitable in the full sense. And we also saw that, you know, for a lot of the NGOs, they had driven costs down so far that even though the impacts weren't huge, the costs weren't huge either. And they actually look like a pretty good bet relative to a lot of other investments which are getting more attention. Mm -hmm. So it really changed the picture and I'd like to see more of that kind of work. And, and particularly because, you know, I think we, we have to factor in, uh, as David Rudman initially argued, that some of the benefit of microcredit isn't just the uh, direct benefit to the borrowers, it's the creation of these institutions that are well run, that are treating customers fairly, that are changing expectations, that are training an incredible number of people, that are employing a very large number of people, um, all sort of bundled into this cost of delivering a microcredit. Now, um, we do have uh, a question here from uh, Beth Ryan um, that about um, any of these impact evaluations in the context of the pandemic. And um, the answer is mostly no, although I will point to a paper that Jonathan and I collaborated on uh, in Pakistan that surveyed a bunch of um, uh, microcredit borrowers on the impact to them on what was happening to their businesses. Um, and use that as an advertisement. Beth herself has a great new piece up at the CGAP site um, looking at what's happening for microcredit in the pandemic uh, in moratoria, how that's affecting customers and how that's affecting um, other, uh, uh, how it's affecting the uh, microcredit providers. Uh, and she links to a whole bunch of other research on, on what the impact is on borrowers on microcredit, uh, borrowers and microcredit institutions. Um, we also have a comment here from Liz McGinnis. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. I, you know, what, what Liz McGinnis is saying is, you know, it can be, we need to have a gender lens here. And the, in Grameen America, all, all the customers are women. And Liz McGinnis is saying, hey, we got to pay attention to the fact that this is often a household choice. It can make sense to have one partner with a wage job that might provide benefits while having another partner moving in and out of um, self-employment. So we start to see it holistically and we think about this with a gender lens, we can maybe appreciate better how this works and what the real impacts and, and value really of microcredit might be. It's a great point. Yeah, and I think that's consistent too if we think internationally about why many micro enterprises don't grow is because they're operated by women who have all sorts of other constraints that growth isn't really a plausible option for them. Uh, although- <clears throat> Or even desired. Right, right. Um, because of the other constraints. Tim, uh, we're at 12.01. So we are. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give us just a few more minutes here. Um, okay. 
to sort of wrap this up. You're the um, boss. Um, we, uh, we kept it short um, uh, so that uh, we wouldn't burn people out too much. But, um, you know, I want to touch on, you know, what questions we need answered from here. So uh, one of the big questions for funders isn't just, should I continue to invest in microcredit? And I have uh, a couple of chapters and a new book called The Future of Microfinance that argues that they should continue investing in microcredit in very specific ways. Uh, that there's a good argument for that. But you know, funders should also care about what questions need answering now. How are we going to push things forward? So, you know, Jonathan, if you were to answer the question from a funder, if I'm investing in research in microcredit right now, what questions need answering? Yeah, I mean, I think the big, one of the big ones is the one we started with, which is, you know, to the extent that we think these impact evaluations are capturing the right thing and they're not finding much impact on income as expected or business, you know, successes as expected, what is the value proposition? And I think there are lots of stories behind that. And I think a lot of it has to do with the liquidity and being able to manage life better. Um, but I think really getting at that more rigorously would be job one. Mm. Um, uh, you know, for my part, one of the things that I find most intriguing is some of the work on uh, targeting and flexibility. Um, so on the flexibility side, if we acknowledge that providing liquidity services is a really, really important part of this equation, can we do more to make a product that does provide liquidity but is uh, sustainable for the, uh, for the institution to deliver? And then are there ways that we can do cheap things to identify who those gung-ho entrepreneurs are? Um, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a really big puzzle because um, part of the reason microfinance has gotten to the scale it has is because uh, even though it's not fully profitable, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't require a lot of subsidy. And a, you know, one way to think about the findings that we see is that a whole lot of reluctant entrepreneurs are funding the scale necessary to serve those gung-ho entrepreneurs who are doing better. And that may actually be the best that we can do because uh, you, you can't, there aren't enough gung-ho entrepreneurs to operate uh, a, a microcredit institution. Um, there aren't enough of them to make the economics work. Um, we have a couple more questions here um, that uh, are uh, easy to tee up and we'll answer um, these questions we have and then we'll wrap up. So, um, you know, Jonathan, this almost seems like a softball to us about ethnographic. Yeah, uh, yeah Jeff Krieger has this interesting for, point in the Q&A, right? Um, he says, what about ethnography? What about more qualitative um, takes on this? Great point. I totally think that we're missing opportunities, huge opportunities by not spending the time to do serious qualitative work alongside RCTs. Sometimes instead of, but I think the power is to combine them. Love to see more work like that. And in fact, in a project that I can't announce yet, but hope too soon, um, we're gonna do exactly that. Um, I, I'm just, I'm going to, because we do have some funding from uh, the MasterCard Impact Fund to be able to do that. We know that we're moving forward in a couple of countries is what Jonathan's referring there is uh, something we call the small firm diaries. And hopefully we will be announcing all of the details of that over the next uh, month. But we are going to be doing diaries of uh, small employer firms, two to 10 employees in a bunch of countries, we hope. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, there's a question here about, you know, the perennial thing and Jonathan of interest rates and how much do the interest rates um, affect the impact? You know, of course, if we gave people 0% loans, if we gave them free money, they would be better off than having to pay the interest back. You know, how do you think about where we are in the conversations about uh, interest rates um, in, in microcredit right now? Uh, super quickly, for a long time, people said, you know, experts says interest rates don't matter. That always when you know right up against basic economic theory people do care about interest rates so putting aside impacts you know raising interest rates lowers demand people are sensitive to interest rates and they should be i mean we all you know have scarce income i think interest rate policy needs more attention and high interest rates are not a recipe for success um you know at the same time i would argue particularly in the united states context right this kind of operation is not um, going to cover costs. If you want to reach low income people in the United States, it's much, much more expensive and difficult than it is in other countries. 
uh, the microcredit providers, whether it's Grameen uh, at 12 to 15 percent interest or the ones that are providing the much larger loans, you're still not getting to sustainability on the loans. You're not going to make enough money on the loans uh, at rates that are affordable to people. And the way those institutions are managing that is they're making loans that are not profitable overall in a full economic cost. Uh, and so um, to, to the specific question, I don't see a lot of profiteering. Um, there are predatory lenders out there who are profiteering, but in the microcredit sector at this point, I don't see a lot of profiteering. If anything, uh, more institutions are operating with a subsidy that they need to keep the prices low uh, and, and make sure that they can operate at scale. Um, I will, uh, again, a couple of quick other advertisements here. I mentioned the savings webinar because there's a question about savings. Uh, my big bugaboo in savings is that there's no definition of the word savings. Um, we talk about savings a lot without clearly uh, explaining what it is that we're talking about, how long money has to be set aside before it counts as savings, when does it stop being savings. So if savings are, are of interest, please do join us on October 28th. Uh, also on Monday, uh, there's a webinar at 11 a.m. hosted by Aspen's Business Ownership Initiative on particular questions of getting capital to communities of color in the United States and the role that uh, CDFI lending plays there. So you can find that on the Aspen uh, Business Ownership Initiative website. Um, well, where we talk about some of these challenges of what are appropriate interest rates, what are the necessary infrastructure, what does PPP mean in the United States for uh, getting loans out to people who need to be borrowing $10,000, $20,000, $50,000. Um, so finally, uh, we're going to close with this, Jonathan. This is our wrap-up question. I'm okay. going to rephrase Amy's question here, which is, you know, if you had to pick out one most interesting thing, um, from microcredit impact evaluations. Um, and one thing that you think they didn't answer, because you have a piece on why, why the impact evaluations didn't answer the most important questions. Um, if you had to pick out the most interesting thing that you've seen in impact evaluations, uh, what do you think that is? Yeah, so I want to thank Amy Davis for that, uh, that question. Without going into it deeply, I, I'm going to answer, answer the second one first, which is the most limiting issue with these evaluations. And that is that a lot of the international, from my take, a lot of these evaluations, they happen where they can happen, uh, sort of opportunistically. They are not telling us about the typical experience of long-term borrowers. They're in marginal populations, often in marginal uh, sites. And that is very limiting. And it could be that the experiences of long-term borrow borrowers are really different from what we're seeing um, even in the best um, RCT so far. The most novel finding, I mean, I think the headline findings that incomes are not going up is, is striking. Again, it's a narrow set of studies in a narrow set of circumstances, but it is a challenge you know, for all of us. But to me, it doesn't, suggests that we should say, let's forget all this. It says, let's understand why people keep on coming back and value these organizations and relationships. So I'll close this off with you know, my version of the answer to the, the first question, which is, I think it really is remarkable that we went from a place where we had essentially no formal lending to people at this economic tier to a point that you know, when the microcredit movement started, if you had told people you were going to go and offer loans to people making under $2 a day, uh, they would have called you crazy and said you could never do it or be vilified you because you were doing terrible, terrible things to these people and trapping them in debt. And to me, the consistency that we see in all of these, and uh, they're narrow, but they're quite different from each other, is that you can operate a business like this that is, does meet the market test but also doesn't seem to be harming people, at least on average or, or, or in large amounts. And so we built this incredible infrastructure to reach several hundred million people in the, in the form of financial services at, at a cost of, you know, I'm, I'm hyperbolizing here, but at pennies, um, which, you know, I don't really think no one would have believed in 1975. Um, and so to me, that's the remarkable thing is we built this infrastructure now that allows us to, to think about how we can get better, how we can continue to reach these people with better products, how, how we can get more, thing, more tools in their hands. Um, and and I, I really worry sometimes that we, uh, we gloss over that incredible achievement 
uh, you know, no other intervention around the world has gotten to this kind of scale for this kind of cost uh, and provided a platform for, for building on. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think, I think it's an important finding that is obscure. And I think it's the most important thing for us to be taking away, even from this Grameen America uh, evaluation is that, you know, as you said, people like it, they feel better. Something else is going on and we need to find that out. But this is definitely worth continuing to invest in and in, in finding ways to use the platform that we've created. With that, we're 10 minutes over our initial announcement. Um, we certainly appreciate all of you who have joined us today. We hope it was interesting. If you uh, did like this format of uh, listening to us talk about some things, please do let us know um, and we, we may do it again. Um, thanks also for CFI for, cre for curating Financial Inclusion Week. Um, and uh, this, uh, we did record this and it will be posted on our site and on YouTube. So please do take the opportunity to share that with friends and colleagues. And final advertisement, if you're not a subscriber to The Five, please do go ahead and subscribe to The Five and keep track of our work uh, with small firm diaries and in microcredit and household financial security around the world. Um, and uh, finally, thank you to the MasterCard Impact Fund in collaboration with the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for underwriting so much of what we do. Um, thanks all for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of your final day of Financial Inclusion Week. Take care. So long.